Hello, I'm Samuel George London, writer of the Victorian space series Milford Green and host of the podcast Comics for the Apocalypse. Feel free to follow me on Instagram or Twitter on Samuel G London and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual from across the pond. He is a very talented writer, as well as a host of a very intriguing Comics for the Apocalypse show. Joined today by the ever-talented Samuel George London. <laughs> How are you doing today? Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Absolute pleasure to be here, Kurt. On that other social media network where we happen to, to co inside you inviting me onto your show it was a fun experience and i always love being on other people's podcasts and i find out you're also a comic book writer as well too so we'll have a blast just chit chatting about your your extensive and elusive life <laughs> looking forward to it thanks <laughs> for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talking my comic book writing career let's say funny to word it like that but it all started off with this uh, initial idea that i had for a book called milk Green. And I had that idea in 2017 and ran the Kickstarter for it in 2018. And for those that haven't come across it just yet, it's basically about this socially awkward inventor called Alfie Fairfield in the Victorian village of Milford Green, when one day an alien spacecraft crash lands in front of him. And the events of the story unfold from there, basically. And um, for all intents and purposes, it's best described as Victorians versus aliens, <laughs> basically, which is a lot of fun. And that kind of brought me into the world of comic book writing, at least. And then from there, uh, I've had uh, had two other installments of Milford Green, which got bigger each and every time. So I kind of made it into a trilogy and that series is completed now. I've had several other titles uh, like Project Hoax, uh, which is like an all ages horror story. It's kind of best described in simple terms. It's a British Stranger Things, <laughs> essentially. I've also got a series that was published called The S Factor, which is a, about a superhero dating reality TV show that's available from all good comic book shops. Well, you can order it through them. <laughs> <laughs> that is. <laughs> uh, but then they'll get it eventually, I hope. In recent years, uh, my series Band of Warriors, which is kind of like a, a mashup of Greek and Celtic mythology. I've also got a couple of other things in the works that I cannot talk about, but I do have something that I can talk about later, which we'll get into. Oh, yeah. But we'll keep that as a bit of a teaser <laughs> so people keep on listening. But other than that, as you kindly said, I do also host my own podcast called Comics for the Apocalypse. And that is show that I've been running for about the past three years. We're at episode 170 at the moment, um, which is pretty cool. You yourself have been on, Kurt, so thank you so much for coming on. Um, but just to give people a premise, I ask creators what comics they take into an apocalypse. And the apocalypse isn't always the same. I've got like eight preset apocalypses that you get to choose from, but you choose a number and then I set it <laughs> it's a lot of fun and i hope you had fun oh, on it yeah. Kurt. and we get all sorts of uh, comic creators on the show so you know not just from those that like the superhero genre it's all sorts we even had a chap on the other day called alan haverholm he's really into abstract comics nice. so if you really want to kind of go way out left field <laughs> in comics then alan is the guy to speak to if you want to you know go into the kind of not deep dark corners but kind of <laughs> the abstract corners <laughs> Of comics they go check that out the fringe of comics where yeah. not many tread and those that do are creative we'll call them <laughs> exactly there you go <laughs> i don't think they mind being called eccentric they probably they probably bask in that so yeah they're definitely eccentric we do have lots to talk about of course the exclusive as well too as a writer in comics what is it about writing does it energize you or does it drain you it absolutely energizes me. And that's a really good way to put it, actually. Yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet or something. I'm a bit of an idea machine. I think of ideas and I can kind of like run with them. Bit of a pinball machine, let's say, <laughs> when it comes to that. Like, dig, 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 dig. Let's take Milford Green, for example. That idea came to me when I was just walking with my family in some local hills you know it's southern england so it's kind of like rolling hills lots of farm fields around full of kind of like you know crops and things like that um, and for those that have read milford green you'll see that the alien spacecraft crash lands in a field of crops and that's kind of 
where it came from. But basically, yeah, during that walk, I just had this vision of an alien spacecraft crash landing into a field in front of me. And I was like, ah, that's a really interesting idea. I kind of, you know, didn't think too much about it. Then two weeks later, I went to a local mock Victorian village, just kind of, you know, it's one of those things that you do. When you got kids, <laughs> basically, and we, yeah, exactly. It's a sightseeing thing, and went to that, and then I could only but imagine aliens walking around this Victorian village. I kind of like put two and two together, you know, aliens in this Victorian village, this alien spacecraft. I'd had a vision of crash landing in some crop fields. The idea bubbled from there, basically. And that's another good phrase to put it, is that it it bubbles inside of me. It's kind of literally like boiling water, like the bubbles like a small at first and then before you know it it's like (laughs) and uh, uh, maybe too much and I'm trying to really pin it down I love the process of writing and and I only wish that I had more time to do it unless you're doing everything yourself which I I don't think you are because you've literally only said you were a writer in our yes, notes here. What is yeah. the amazing team beside yourself that are working on this amazing comic? My collaborator and uh, let's say my better half of, of, of my comic uh, comic book career is a chap called uh, Michael Hankinen. He's an artist from Finland. We came together because originally I approached one of his counterparts called Ellie Pugarkis, who has a webcomic called Tisto. And I came across her through DeviantArt. When I was first initially trying to figure out what the art style would be for Milford Green, it was quite difficult to imagine because it's obviously it's Victorians and aliens. Like, how do you actually combine that and get the right tone for both tisto it's kind of like it's got victorian sensibilities in it but it's also fantastical there's like scandinavian magical monsters and things like that and i felt like oh that was could definitely possibly do it unfortunately ellie was unavailable and so she recommended michael and we just hit it off michael loved the idea and he was keen as mustard to get involved i was keen as mustard to to get him involved and yeah we worked on the whole series together through three kickstarters which was brilliant and then in fact we had a second title which i didn't mention at the start called access denied which is it's a futuristic retelling of romeo and juliet based on mars (laughs) so that's that's a lot of fun back to that collaboration it was absolutely incredible it was my first collaboration because milford green was my first comic it was just amazing michael is such a professional he gets things done so efficiently effectively it's so amazing if you look in some of the behind the scenes stuff in the comics you'll see that sometimes i kind of like do like loads of stick men drawing yeah (laughs) like really 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 rubbish but it's just incredible that obviously takes me like 10 seconds to do and just kind of like a basic layout and then michael will spend two days and come out with the front cover it's like whoa amazing I wish I was that talented. It was an incredible collaboration. And in the future, we, we do hope to work together again on something, possibly a sequel to, to Access Denied. But also we've got another title that one day love to make together okay. as well. We'll have to wait and see. As the series is finally completed, what have you learned about yourself, not only creatively, but maybe personally, in terms of putting all of this together? Yeah, that's a great question. What have I learned? I've learned that you shouldn't take too much on. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that you can absolutely burn out on this stuff, particularly if you are doing it in your spare time. Do be careful that you don't overdo it. Because if you've got work responsibilities, family responsibilities, you can absolutely end up overdoing it. So I think I've I've learned where my limits are, where I can say that's the edge. Like I can't go any further in terms of my workload for instance. So I learned my limits from that aspect. I also learned that would much prefer to outsource all of the fulfillment for Kickstarters. <laughs> it's just like the worst bit of a Kickstarter, running a Kickstarter is having to actually like pack it all together. You know what? The first one was really fun because you get to see it, putting it all together and things like that. And that was really fun. But when you get to about your seventh Kickstarter, that's when it really starts to become a chore <laughs> to have to do the fulfillment. The real reward is when they do land on doorsteps, you start seeing photos on social media and or just people just send an email saying you know this was absolutely fantastic really really enjoyed it well done and i hope that you make more there are challenges within it but you know the rewards definitely outweigh them thank you to everybody that has you know, supported, supported my work i feel uh, sad for your postal 
workers there. You know, it's that crazy guy again with the 60 million packages. Honestly, yeah. Like on the, on the first one, so you, thankfully now they've actually got a really good system of how you do that. Firstly, you can print off all the labels at home. And like you, you guys have got the same. But you can also do it so that you can take the packages along and kind of print it out spreadsheet that you give to them, do it for you. And th- But on the first one, oh my gosh. So I literally turned up with yeah about 100 packages per go and i went through the self-service checkouts <laughs> as well i mean luckily there was quite a few there but i like basically was on one of those self-service checkouts for about an hour <laughs> you know doing it all manually but i got into a good conversation with the staff and they enjoyed it <laughs> i think i think all of the other customers didn't like me but <laughs> the, st- the staff enjoyed it looking at future projects that you have you, you've hinted at a couple that you can't talk about and you've hinted at some that that you've already worked on as well too here so that's great to see so creatively or you're doing wonderful in that regard here i believe you mentioned you have a, a kickstarter coming up or at least maybe next year i'm not sure i'll let you describe that all of the crowdfunding is still up in the air like if we're gonna absolutely go down the crowdfunding route if it does end up going down the crowdfunding route it'll be summer that will do it this has been in the works for probably like the past six months essentially i've managed to work with an animator called amy mclernan she has animated a trailer that i Kind of wrote and then we collaborated on it for an animated feature film of Milford Green, just the first one. But yeah, we're hoping to assemble a team of animators, voice actors, even music composers, and try and do a complete animated feature film for Milford Green, completely independent. There are still some some cogs that need to, <laughs> need to be put in place. The, the aim is to get to go for summer if we get to pull it off. And I thought this would be a great place to show off that one minute trailer. Lucky for you, you said to me, and going to appear right now. Alfie Fairfield, you must eliminate the Synax and take the Wurren back to the United Galactic Alliance. The Abbey of Dawn to return were run to us. Otherwise, we will destroy your settlement and take it for ourselves. Alfie, we all set. The Queen, Country, and Milford Green. Let's do this! Well, you don't see that every day. It was beautifully done, really. It was yeah. a great trailer. It was funny because I ended up, uh, when I was going through it, I actually watched that first before I read the first great. book. <laughs> so cool. I was like, all right, well, this is cool. I, I like this concept. I, I think this the animation was really well done and really made your book come alive. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it was so cool. I've always kind of thought that you know this would really like the milford green series would really lean well into a trilogy of animated yeah. feature films at some stage if the opportunity isn't being pushed in front of you you've got to make that happen i was kind of looking around for animators and came came across amy said would you be able to basically use the digital element elements of, of the webcomic to do this trailer and i'd written the trailer as it basically is we, we we shifted a couple of things around retrospectively but it's it's essentially the one that i wrote in the first place <laughs> which is i was quite pleased with when she had completed the whole thing i got butterflies in my belly you know it's just like ah this is amazing so cool and i would love the day that that actually got turned into a full feature length film everybody if you enjoyed that trailer and you've enjoyed milford green or you know feel free to go grab a copy of milford green on my etsy either digitally or physically fingers crossed watch this space summer for a full feature film (laughs) of milford green on kickstart what is your creative kryptonite not being prepared (laughs) and not not having the right setup when i say that so for me writing is based all around having a solid outline for your story before i actually start on the script i really try to nail the outline as much as i can and i tend to use story structure frameworks for that whether it be eight point story arc recently 
I've been experimenting with using Save the Cat, for instance, for it. Some people will be like, no, don't use Save the Cat. It's like the worst thing ever that's <laughs> ever happened to like movies and stuff. It's just some scaffolding, take and leave like bits of it, even from a story, but it just really helps you outline solidly. Uh, so that when you do get into the actual script writing itself, then you know exactly where you're going. So I absolutely have to have that in place before actually setting out on the script itself and then when it comes down to having the right setting and things like that i need to make sure that i'm not going to be disturbed as well i've got two young kids and you know busy family life work life and things for me i use sunday evenings as my time to write and i absolutely know that i'm not going to be disturbed i can put away two or three hours of solid writing on a sunday evening without being disturbed whatsoever and that's just come from having <laughs> lived through many times where I've been getting disturbed, you get frustrated. Yeah, for me, booking out Sunday evenings for, for doing comic writing is, is what works for me. So ensuring that you've got the right setting and kind of situation for your writing, and then also making sure that you're prepared through a really solid outline. And then that's how you avoid getting killed by the kryptonite. <laughs> Or writer's block. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? A language had power. Yeah. That's a cool one. Um, yeah. No, that's a really interesting question really I'm trying to remember i think it's probably on a school playground to be honest <laughs> like and somebody saying something absolutely horrific <laughs> like or crikey yeah. yeah no but i'll tell you what so one time in music class a friend of mine was getting pestered by somebody that we were kind of acquaintances with let's say he just said something completely wrong and my mate just totally flipped out, pushed this guy up against this window, but there were like bars on the window. Um, and so he went slamming into the into the bars, but it, even then it still smashed the window behind. The glass all came shattering down. Nobody got hurt that, that bad or anything. No cuts from the glass, that is. But, I mean, that is just an experience of, you know, words can absolutely just flip somebody. <laughs> like that. So yeah, I mean, you can absolutely use that in your writing. So it is incredible how words can can flip somebody on their head. That or when a parent swears for the first time or things like that. I mean, that can exactly said a bad word. I can use that now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work for politics. It doesn't work for lawyers. It doesn't work for your lifestyle. <laughs> exactly, exactly, man. <laughs> so then as a writer, what was the first thing that you wrote that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? It would be Milford Green, absolutely. I did try to write stuff in my younger years, like particularly, particularly my kind of like mid and late, teenage years i was kind of writing stuff you know it wasn't until my early 30s that i thought oh actually i could really give this a go so it has just been since you know 2018 that i've been thinking that ah i could give this a go <laughs> so what was the hardest scene for you to write in the series yeah the hardest part actually was the ending in the third book in defend milford green i came up with about three different endings for it and i was really struggling to like actually pin it down i ended up kind of like combining the three of them like in like a bit of a makeshift way uh, ultimately i'm really happy with how it turned out but it was really difficult to actually try and bring it all to a head i worked it out in the end and i do feel quite proud of it people seemingly like it yeah no i'm i'm really happy with it so what was difficult about that mm. yeah um trying to remember the exact circumstances really i was actually yeah struggling i think with the exact motivations perhaps for alfie and mary at the end and trying to strike the right balance of their motivations and trying to figure out where all the other players were going to be as well um who you'll get introduced to in the second one it was literally kind of like a bit of a it was a total jigsaw puzzle of trying to actually put that all of together the main thing was the motivations of the of the two main characters usually it's the beginning that people struggle with rather than you mm. know the, the ending yeah yeah no seemingly i don't have a, a too much of an issue with the beginnings endings are probably my 
probably my kryptonite and my <laughs> weakest weakest point of trying to actually pin that down it all comes with experience i guess and you know hopefully in future years i'll i'll get better and better at that <laughs> neil gaiman is a good benchmark for a variety of different writing styles and genres as well too so you yes. know something to work from i guess oh absolutely you bet i, I have actually watched his masterclass <laughs> videos which were really interesting nice um so yeah Aaron Sorkin is is really, and I think he's a good teacher yeah. as well. Um, I think he knows what he's what he's having to present. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And you know what? I, I do feel as though we can absolutely learn from other mediums as well, whether it's screenwriting, novel writing, you know, short story writing. The more strings that you can add to your bow, the better. Doesn't that become a harp? Yes, exactly. Then you become a heart player. <laughs> <Yeah>. Awesome. <laughs> Bingo. In the series here, what are some of the themes that spoke to you as a writer? Main themes for me was essentially overcoming evil, uh, but also working together and collaborating as well. You'll see in the later ones as well is the need for, for people to accept who they are um even if they're you know half from one way of life and half from another way of life it's a total cliche you know over overcoming evil and by working together i guess <laughs> which and it's terrible because i am such a you know 90s kid yeah. in terms of you know i grew up on transformers and so optimus prime is like is basically my dad just <laughs> <laughs> like you know that's all i grew up on was 90s morality cartoons <laughs> so thunder thundercats yeah. was another major one for me what else was there I, really, I mean x-men oh yeah. you know the, yeah, the, the yeah. x-men cartoons uh batman yeah the animated series Spider-Man. um yeah even gobots oh, you know <laughs> wow. oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> and then, you know what was really funny was watching the transformers the movie for the first time um and i'm not talking for anybody that's uh I think I'm coming uh, out of left field with uh, Michael Bay movies, not yeah, the Michael no. Bay movies, yeah. the animated <laughs> Transformers movie from 1986. Mm-hmm. Um, watching that and then, spoiler alert, um, yeah, watching Optimus Prime die yeah. uh, was, <laughs> it was heartbreaking. Ew, <laughs> but then I really, I, you know what? It's really funny that I think there are those that watch Transformers in the 80s and they hated the movie and then those that watched it in the 90s i actually really enjoyed the movie i really got into hot rod yeah. um but it, it like seemingly that didn't work out like because they, they brought optimus prime back and they're like no that was that wasn't real that didn't happen <laughs> Just like every other Marvel and DC series that ever comes out. Oh, you died. Uh, you'll be back next week. It's fine. Exactly. Yeah, man. <laughs> you just took a six month hiatus to take you or whatever, you know, it's all exactly. Good. <laughs> yeah, man. Let's move on to the podcasting side of things here, because obviously that is something you've been doing for, for three years now. You did an excellent job of the show itself. Thank I, you. I enjoy you as a host and your other setup truly shows the epitome of your voice, which could rival optimus prime in my opinion i'm just saying wow wow so it has a deep (laughs) bassy you know feel to it so i love it so whoever your sound engineer is keep hiring him because he does a good job talk about the the show itself here because i think the concept is unique it's definitely interesting it it's not something that you normally see in, in a typical interview where it's just a simple answer back and forth type question here talk about the the first guest you were excited about having on your show it was really cool there's a show in the uk on bbc radio 4 called desert island discs now this show has been is like one of the oldest running radio shows in the world it's been going i think since like 1947 or something like that for the past like 70 odd years they've been asking well-known and notable people what music tracks on discs obviously at the time would you take onto a desert island and they asked them for eight uh, songs and kind of through that format they end up going through their life story how they came to accomplish whatever they've accomplished whether they're a scientist or novelist or or something like that yeah i kind of put the idea together of you know what if we did that with comics how would you frame it and i just thought you'd, you'd do it through an apocalypse 
you know, and, and so the idea of comics for the apocalypse came to be. I did it a bit differently on Desert Island Disc. They just asked for eight tracks that that person particularly enjoy. But I go down specific routes in terms of, you know, the first comic that you remember enjoying, uh, what's the funniest comic that you've read, saddest comic that you've read, even your favourite cover, and then kind of finish on the one comic you'd take into the apocalypse if you could only take one. It's been really, really fun. First guest that I was really excited about it was Heather Antos actually yeah so she was on episode eight or something like that I managed to get her I don't know how just totally random like I think I I managed to get her email off of her website or something and just emailed her on the off chance and she just replied back and was like yeah sure sounds fun I was like, cool. <laughs> and then I was like, ah, crazy. Um, that was uh, that was really cool. Um, and then since then, I've managed to get some quite big names that I'm quite proud of, such as Charlie Adlard, Mark Wade, and even David Lloyd as well, who's the artist for Viva Vendetta. He's most known for, amongst other things. It's been an incredible journey, um, and it's it's great to have a forum where I can speak to other comic book creators and talk comics and like yourself, Kurt, you're able to connect with other comic book lovers and creators through this format. It's a fantastic thing to do, I think. The first show is usually always the hardest because that's when all shit is going to hit the fan. Something inevitably will go wrong. Oh, yeah. It's good that you've persevered and continued on, been consistent with a weekly release schedule. That's the best yeah. part about having a show is that if you have the content and if you have the guests coming on and if you have consistency, you're going to do well no matter if it's a long format show or if it's a short format show. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, and you're, you're totally right. Um, consistency is, is the key and I've generally been able to stick to the weekly release with occasional kind of holidays here and there it's a fantastic experience and long may it continue and next year i should be hitting episode 200 so i'm trying to think who i can try and get for that i'll have to wait and see um, <laughs> i'm gonna gonna try and kind of use the contacts that i've made already to go for even further than david lloyd <laughs> so try for alan moore yeah, sure. right. Hey. The, hey. the day. No yeah. way. Just <laughs> give it. it a go. I'll give it a go. <laughs> worst, worst thing that they do is they won't see it or they'll say no. Oh, no. Yeah. You try it. Exactly, right. man. The show itself is very tight. You do a great edit. You have great, consistent questions. You have fun with it as well, too, because that was the one thing I enjoyed about our conversation was, you know, I thought I was bringing something different with web comics to your side of things, but sadly, I was mistaken. You've already had that. So, you know, <laughs> I think it's it's great that you're enjoying it because a lot of times you with a show like this, you can easily get burnt out. That's the hardest yeah. part about staying consistent, too. Yeah, no, totally. And you do have to try and make sure that you keep it keep it fresh for yourself definitely i've had probably in the region of maybe 20 return guests that sort of thing but you know everybody's been brand new to it and, and everybody does give completely different answers which just shows the sheer variation in comics um which is absolutely wonderful and just yeah also the answers to, to you know what you'd actually do in, a, in an apocalypse how you'd actually go about survive, trying to survive it as well <laughs> which is fantastic I love, there's been some very creative and in it, innovative um takes on on things is and if anything it it has given me Lots of food for thought if an apocalypse ever does come in the varying apocalypses that I've, I've set people in, whether it be a standard zombie outbreak or ones that could really happen like a solar flare or a super volcano. Yeah, I'll be prepared. Now I have to ask here, what apocalypse would you want to try to survive it? Yeah, out of all of them, if I had to choose one of them, it would probably have to be the solar flare one. I reckon, because that just knocks out the electrics, basically. And although, obviously, that will destroy technology for quite a while, <laughs> um, it just means that we just have to pick up the technology again, um, and it's survivable as long as you can kind of look after yourself above a camp stove for several months, which I feel like I'm I'm capable of, <laughs> along with my, my family, of course. That's the one that I'd pick out of all of them, because then they'd come back. If it was a super volcano, that causes, I mean, obviously, 
depends how close you are to it. If you're really close, then you are screwed, full stop. <laughs> if it's, you know, if it is Yellowstone and I'm in the UK, that still has a massive impact. It causes tremendous amounts of climate change in the opposite direction, like into, we turn into an ice ball for a time because of all of the ash you know, yeah. across the sky, go into a second ice age for a time. Or a typical Tuesday in Canada. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Like, so, you know, the equator would be yeah. like Canada. Uh, Canada would be like really, really cold. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really difficult. And then all the others are just going to be really terribly difficult, whether it be like a super intelligent ape uprising, an AI take over a zombie outbreak at least with like the solar flare you've only got to worry about the humans with a zombie outbreak you've got to worry about the humans and the zombies i feel that's the most survivable <laughs> how do you think the birth of creativity was formed that's a great question it is interesting kind of when you you see animals birds of paradise for instance they're dancing i mean that's creative isn't it in itself so maybe 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 it comes from mating <laughs> creativity it probably does you know just thinking about it you just do anything to get laid <laughs> basically <laughs> the creative process runs from there but then i guess you know for humans specifically it's a case of because we've got so much going on in our brains obviously that's that's just going to increase as time goes on there's more things happen in the world we, you know, we've got more devices and are we going to be able to connect our brains to computers properly you know something like Neuralink to take us to the next evolution of, of human minds and things a lot of it is working through your own personal issues a little bit perhaps but at the same time it's kind of the need to tell people's stories the origin of creativity comes from a primal place probably where it continues i think the sky's the limit Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? It's got to be my mum. It's a cliche. <laughs> and my mum's uh, particularly inspiring. My father passed away when I was eight years old. He took his own life. And I've got three siblings, a, a brother and two sisters. She managed to, to raise us to be at least half sound and decent human beings. <laughs> yeah, no, she's a continual source of inspiration. She's incredibly strong woman and inspiring that she managed to keep it all together through you know thick and thin so yeah my mum not cliche at all you have to give credit no. where credit's due <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> thanks <laughs> from a professional standpoint you've created multiple comics you are a talented comic book writer you also have an amazing podcast as well too and continue to do extremely well there professionally in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful yeah, I guess. In terms of my uh, comic book side career, I do consider myself successful. I'm proud of the titles that I've written, help bring to life. And then also, yeah, the podcast. I'm really proud that, you know, I've managed to publish so many episodes and uh, connect with people and that the interviewees and the actual uh, listeners enjoy it as well. So, yeah, I would I would consider myself successful, I guess. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I try my best to learn from it. I've always tried to learn from failure. I was a skateboarder, BMXer when I was younger. And then I, I was a snowboard instructor, in fact, for, for a time during my mid-20s. In Banff, I was a snowboard instructor. Through kind of, yeah extreme sports i don't think you kind of say that anymore but that's what you said in the 90s like extreme sports <laughs> um yeah you learn you learn from failing basically it's like it's embedded in the culture and so i've always tried to learn from my failures and i encourage everybody to do that just to just accept the fact that you have failed that once and that as long as you take a step back and try to figure out why you did fail then you can learn from it and move forward and hopefully be successful the next time the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way and the fact that you have the younger generation with you uh hopefully they're becoming inspired to be creative in some way shape or form whether it's as a, a writer or a, maybe a podcast host or a youtuber or whatever the case may be creatively hopefully you've inspired them in some way shape or form how can they inspire the generation that follows them so yeah, that's a great question. To inspire the next generation, I think you kind of have to engage <laughs> with the with the next generation, in fact, to try and cultivate creativity in their own way, holding a butterfly metaphor where, you know, if you clasp your hand too much, then it's obviously going to die. But if you release your fingers too much, then it's going to 
let it go. Yeah, it's about engaging. So, I mean, for instance, me personally, my daughter goes to school and on World Book Day last year, I went in with my all ages horror story project hoax gave them all a copy to read like the week before we spoke about it on world book day and then i went through the creative process of how i did that we actually ended up creating a comic together which was really fun and it i forget what the title was it was like rats in the toilet or something like that (laughs) it's a really lo-fi uh story but uh, obviously it was a lot of fun it's engaging with the next generation that's how you do it if your life was a comic book or a movie what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be Mm, cool you could call it the roller coaster (laughs) <laughs> Let's go with that, the roller coaster. My soundtrack, I am really big on a band called M83. I don't know, or M83. I don't know if you've come across them at no. all. They were involved in the soundtrack with Daft Punk on uh, Tron Legacy. Oh, okay. They're, they're also French, <laughs> so another French uh, electronic band. If you actually look at their back catalogue, they've got like a massive array of variation in their actual style and things um so i guess i'd I'd probably have you know one song from every of their albums um kind of like just showing the the evolution of things well samuel i hate to say but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking thank you so much for coming on the show absolute pleasure thank you kurt before i let you go where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find you all over the wild world of the internet? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram under Samuel G London. That's how you can follow me on social media. Uh, Comics for the Apocalypse does have a Facebook page, but I've been terribly distant from <laughs> from that, unfortunately. So uh, yeah, you're best, best off on, on Instagram or Twitter to actually get involved in my work, buy it. I've got an Etsy. My own comics label is Signal Comics. So if you just search for, for Signal Comics on Etsy, that'll come up there. And then obviously I've got a profile on Kick starter that you can follow um, if you search for milford green and then you'll see my icon then you can follow me on kickstarter and then my podcast we're on all the podcast networks so just in your podcast app if you search comics for the apocalypse that'll come up and feel free to to download an episode and if you enjoy it then make sure that you subscribe well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you can of course find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's the word two not the number two of course it's more updated on our youtube channel because i am only one person which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash TGT Media. And of course, we have a link tree which has a lot more social media ways to not only schedule an interview, linktree.com forward slash two geeks talking. As I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.